Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to participate in this SGP graduate school program, even if it's a little bit different online. Uh, in any event, uh, in this segment of the graduate school, we're going to talk about partial differential equations and spectral approaches to geometry processing, which comprise one of the big uh, sort of classes of techniques that people apply in the geometry processing community for analyzing, understanding, editing shapes, uh, along with many other tasks. Uh, lots of our talk today will be based on the contents of a book chapter, uh, which uh, I've added a point or two here, and I'll try to add a link on the uh, YouTube page as well. Uh, the chapter is entitled Intrinsic and Extrinsic Operators for Shape Analysis, and it's part of the Handbook of Numerical Analysis uh, titled uh, Processing, Analyzing, and Learning of Images, Shapes, and Forms, Part 2. Um, really, the person who deserves all the credit for doing the hard work on that book chapter is my student, Yu Wong. Uh, who really did an impressive job uh, collecting all of the uh, different ideas and approaches out there in the spectral geometry universe into one single uh, written document uh, for your convenience. So today, uh, the motivation for our discussion uh, is largely based on a very famous mathematical paper uh, in the sort of mid 20th century. Um, this paper was titled, Can You Hear the Shape of a Drum? This is a very famous uh, mathematical phrase and it gets abused all the time. You know, at this point you can hear the shape of all kinds of different objects. Uh, but the basic motivation of this original paper uh, was a question uh, which looks something like this. So let's say that I'm in a room with a musician who has a, a drum kit in front of them, but I look away uh, so I don't know uh, what drum the musician is playing. Uh, but uh, the musician hits the drum with the stick, it makes a sound, uh, and I hear something. Uh, in particular, what I hear is the set of frequencies that the drum makes when it vibrates. And the question is, can I tell what the shape of the drum was based on the audio signal that I heard in my ear? Now, of course, uh, this is a problem posed by mathematicians, and, and they're really asking about the sort of idealized uh, version of this based on the uh, equations of physics rather than you know, something empirical. Uh, but even so, uh, in an ideal universe, the basic question here is, do there exist two drums that are different shape but make the same sound? In other words, is there a link between geometry uh, and vibration frequency? Now, initially, this seems like kind of a crazy question to ask. I mean, um, if you think about the list of vibration frequencies that you hear uh, when, when an object vibrates, really, it's sort of one-dimensional in nature. And somehow what we're asking is to reconstruct a two or three dimensional shape based on a one dimensional signal. But it's not totally unreasonable to ask such a question. Uh, first of all, I, I challenge all of our listeners to go home and start dropping things on the floor and they'll notice it's very difficult to encounter two objects that sound exactly the same uh, when they uh, make that impact. And, and moreover, there are some links uh, between geometry and uh, vibration frequencies that are not so hard to understand. So for example, uh, I play the cello, or here uh, I have an image of a guitar, and any musician that plays a stringed instrument uh, can tell you a very simple relationship between geometry and vibration frequency. Uh, in particular, uh, if you play a guitar or any stringed instrument, you press one of the strings down, then one thing you might notice is that the pitch of the instrument will increase, right? So if you make the string shorter, uh, the sound that you hear becomes higher. Uh, so one way to understand that is that there's a relationship between the length of the string on the instrument and the audio signal that it creates. So this is a really simple sort of one-dimensional relationship uh, between geometry uh, and, and audio, right? That uh, the, the sound that you hear from the string depends on its length. Now, unfortunately, uh, this question, can you hear the shape of a drum, was quickly answered to the negative, um, originally in an extremely high dimensional geometric space that wasn't particularly uh, sort of practical in our everyday lives. And then I think maybe 10, 20 years later, uh, folks actually managed to come up with two isospectral shapes that are really simple shapes in the plane. Um, so if you go home and, and construct these two drums in the shape that I'm showing you on the slide, uh, they actually should, at least in theory, sound pretty much exactly the same. But uh, the takeaway, uh, both empirically and from the uh, underlying mathematics, is that you have to have a really special drum for this to happen. Uh, 
Uh, and in particular, the spectrum, these vibration frequencies that you hear uh, when you hit a drum tell you a lot about the shape, even if they don't tell you 100% of the information outside of that one dimensional case that we just mentioned. So the basic intuition here is that uh, we can learn a lot about a shape by hitting it with a hammer. Now, you know, today's talk isn't about, you know, breaking things apart, but rather hitting things lightly with a hammer and, and noticing the different ways that they vibrate. And in fact, a lot of the state of the art algorithms and geometry processing are built on this basic observation. So what you do is you start with a shape like the uh, Stanford bunny that you see here. You compute its vibration frequencies or its sympathetic frequencies or whatever you want to call it. And then you use that list of numbers as a way to identify the shape. And now, even though you probably can't hear the shape of a bunny exactly, um, the likelihood is that if you have another shape in your data set, it will have a completely different set of vibration frequencies. So this is sort of a reasonable uh, fashion that you can use to distinguish between different objects. And so this is the central focus of an area of mathematics uh, known as spectral geometry, right? So the basic question in spectral geometry uh, is what can you learn about a shape based on its vibration frequencies and oscillation patterns, right? So the frequencies are that list of numbers that tell you the different sort of sympathetic uh, sounds that an object makes when it vibrates. And then the oscillation patterns are the actual sort of visible waves that you might see along the surface that vibrate at different rates. And what we're going to see in today's talk is that this boils down to one uh, eigenvalue problem, uh, which is uh, what you see on this slide. Right? So this uh, delta object on the left-hand side uh, is known as the Laplace operator, and it's really the beginning of a countless number of research papers in the geometry processing universe. So in today's lecture, we're going to structure our talk by first taking a look at uh, the Laplacian operator in more detail. That's this delta you see at the bottom of the slide. I'm going to warn you now, um, one of the really big challenges in the geometry processing literature uh, is that as researchers, we sit right between physics and math, and physicists and mathematicians don't agree on the sign of the Laplacian. Um, and so if you read different research papers in this field, unfortunately, some of them have a plus sign, some of them a minus sign. Um, Sometimes halfway through the research paper, the sign of the Laplacian changes because they're working from like two different textbooks or something. Uh, probably these mistakes have propagated into my slides. Um, so in general, I'm gonna ask that you guys read these slides with a little bit of uh, interpretation here. Those are, you might have to put a minus somewhere where I forgot. I apologize in advance. In any event, uh, we'll first start by introducing the Laplacian operator in many different domains. Then we'll talk about how to discretize Laplace operators, uh, specifically on triangle meshes, which are the basic objects that we encounter uh, in the geometry processing uh, universe. Then we'll talk about some applications of the spectral computation. And then finally, uh, I'll tell you about some new frontiers in geometry universe uh, involving this operator-based approach to geometry processing, uh, but taking that Laplacian, um, which has been pervasive in all of the different uh, learning papers that we face all of the different uh, geometry processing papers uh, that, that we encounter, um, and simply replacing that matrix with another one, and suddenly uh, the algorithms that we have behave very differently. So let's get started. Um, and the first thing we're gonna do is introduce the Laplacian operator. So first, a little bit of a uh, review from your linear algebra course. Uh, one thing that you might remember uh, is the definition of a linear operator. So here I'm using the letter L, L for, for linear. Uh, and a linear operator essentially satisfies two properties, right? One um, is that the linear operator applied to the sum of two uh, objects. So for example, if I apply L to X pl plus Y, that's the same as applying L to X and adding that to applying L to Y. And the second is that if I scale an object in my vector space by some constant C, uh, I can pull that constant to the outside um, without uh, affecting the, the value of, of L. And the uh, canonical example that we have of a linear operator uh, is matrix vector multiplication, right? So if you have a constant vector A, then the function that takes X uh, to A times X uh, certainly satisfies these two properties. Um, and, and really, in finite dimensions, that's the beginning and end of the story, right? That um, there's sort of this duality between doing uh, linear algebra in terms of matrices and vectors and doing linear algebra uh, by thinking about linear operators, and it's very easy to show that these two things are, are basically equivalent. But in infinite dimensional spaces, that's no longer the case. Uh, so for example, um, 
a, a simple example of a linear operator uh, might be the operator that takes in a function f, which is infinitely differentiable, and maps it to the first derivative of f, which I guess would also be infinitely uh, a, a differentiable. So this is an operator, right? It inputs functions and outputs functions. And because of that, it's not so clear how we can describe this operator um, as a matrix uh, vector multiply. Now, it turns out that the uh, Fourier series gives you some way to do that for this particular operator. Um, but there's some linear spaces that are so giant uh, that it's not so clear that you can always do this. In any event, uh, today we're going to be worried about one operator that seems to appear all over the place uh, in your physics class, although you may not have thought about it very carefully. Uh, so as a bit of motivation, uh, let's think about the wave equation shown on the screen here. Uh, so the wave equation is um, exactly what it sounds like. It's the equation that determines the propagation of a wave along, uh, for example, a vibrating string. Uh, so here, uh, we might think of u as a function of time t, like u of t comma x, where x is the spatial variable and t is the time variable. Uh, and the basic uh, relationship uh, between the different derivatives of u, assuming that um, u is representing the propagation of a wave, is that the second derivative of u in time, uh, I guess, is equal to the second derivative of u in space. Okay, so uh, hiding inside of this differential equation, which you may have encountered in physics class, uh, is an operator that operates on u as a geometric object, and that is hiding right here. It's the minus second derivative operator. Okay, and that's going to be our sort of simplest example of a Laplacian operator hiding, uh, in this case, in the physics literature. So to call it out in a little more detail here, uh, you see the minus second derivative uh, operator. Uh, I guess I could write the wave equation as uh, the second derivative of, t of u in time is equal to L uh, of u, uh, where here I'm sort of using L, uh, I guess because I put it on the right-hand side, there should be a minus here. Uh, we're thinking of L as operating on the spatial variable X, which I think is pretty common uh, in, in, in the E world. Uh, and this is going to be the basic operator that we'll spend the next hour and a half uh, analyzing. It's just this map from U to minus its second derivative. Uh, notice I've already made a controversial choice here, which is to put that minus sign in front of D squared U DX squared. So just the same as uh, matrices admitting eigenvectors, uh, this operator admits eigenfunctions. So remember that uh, in general, an eigenvector of a linear operator is uh, something that satisfies L of u equals lambda u for some scalar uh, lambda. So in this particular case, what does that mean? That means that I'm going to take a function, compute its minus second derivative, and get back a scaled version of the same thing. Uh, and one thing that's very easy to double check is that the uh, phi case that I give you at the bottom of the slide here do exactly that, right? Um, in fact, you can kind of eyeball it, right? So the first derivative of sine is minus cosine. Uh, the second derivative is then minus sine, right? So if I take two derivatives, um, I get back sine of pi kx over L, uh, but I get a constant uh, in front, uh, which has to do with the chain rule. And that's exactly what I put on the slide here. Okay, so. Uh, Notice, uh, in order to write down this eigenvalue problem, I had to impose boundary conditions, namely that f of 0 equals f of l equals 0. So in other words, uh, I have this vibrating piece of string. I needed to take that piece of string at its two endpoints and sort of pin them so that they can't move. Otherwise, my domain isn't going to be compact, and I won't have that set of eigenvalues. So already, you know, this example might seem pretty simple, or might basically be just a review of your physics class. But now uh, we can go back and sort of revisit that can you hear the shape of a drum question uh, in the sort of simplest case, which is can you hear the shape of an interval? And the answer is yes, right? I guess interval here is kind of like the mathematical formalism of a piece of string. Uh, and if you take a look at this uh, formula for the eigenvalue, the key feature is that there's a 1 over L factor here, right? Which means that as I increase L, that sequence of eigenvalues that I just computed uh, will, I guess, decrease. So in particular, if I even just know lambda 1, uh, I can reverse engineer uh, to figure out the length of the string. So we actually have a positive answer here. You can hear the length of an interval. 
Uh, and that's exactly this intuition that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, right? That, uh, you know, if you're playing a stringed instrument, there's a relationship between the pitch that you hear and the length of the string. So now let's revisit exactly that same experiment, uh, but this time we'll think about it in the plane. So here's our diagram. So I have a region in the plane that uh, I've labeled omega, uh, and uh, we'll use this uh, red uh, boundary symbol here to denote the outside uh, ring on the outside of lambda, of, 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 yikes, of uh, omega rather. And now the uh, wave equation uh, in this two-dimensional domain uh, is given by the equation on the slide here in green, namely that the uh, second derivative of uh, u in time is equal to uh, the Laplace, minus the Laplacian of u, where again, I've uh, defined the Laplacian to be minus, in this case, the sum of second derivatives, right? So like du dx uh, squared plus du dy uh, squared. Okay, so this is the, uh, the planar uh, wave equation. And there are many different features of uh, this wave equation uh, that are not 100% obvious from the way that I've written the operator here. Um, so one thing that we know from physics, of course, is that if I take a drum and I just rotate it in the plane, um, the drum doesn't sound any different, right? Or like if I pick up the drum and walk to the other side of the room and, and hit it, I'll, I'll still hear the same uh, sounds. Uh, one way to understand that is that uh, the Laplacian operator is intrinsic. So if I take my domain omega and I rotate it, uh, and I compute the Laplacian of a, of a function on that rotated domain, it's the same as a Laplacian on the original one. Notice, by the way, that that's not 100% obvious uh, from the way that I've defined uh, the Laplace operator on this slide, which somehow is uh, involving summing over the x and y uh, coordinates. Uh, so that really is a homework uh, problem that you should check at home, uh, that, that this thing is, is uh, coordinate independent. And in fact, in the sort of curved version of geometry, that property is not so easy to check. So uh, there's many different ways uh, to get to that same Laplace operator. Uh, I think we typically motivate it uh, based on this physical connection to the wave equation. Uh, a different way that we might do it is based on smoothing of a function. Um, so here, uh, again, we have our same domain uh, omega. Uh, and what we're given uh, is the value of some function u on the boundary of a domain. Right, so here, remember that the boundary is like this curve around the outside of omega, uh, like I've, I've kind of highlighted on the side. I apologize for some poor drawing. So we're just given the, uh, the red and blue colors on the boundary, and your task is to take that and interpolate it to the interior of the domain, um, and typically in a smooth fashion. Right now, the way that I've drawn it here is probably not super exciting, uh, but in fact, exactly this intuition is what we use uh, in the semi-supervised learning world, right? So for instance, maybe uh, I have a social network, which I think of like a graph, and at some nodes or of, of the social network, so in other words, for some people, I know some additional information about them, you know? So I know the, uh, I don't know, the likelihood that they like pineapple pizza. And I make an assumption that uh, if I have this property, then my friends are likely to have that property too. Right? So if I view that property as some function on the vertices of a graph, uh, then a very common task is to sort of find the smoothest interpolation of the data that I know uh, to the locations where I don't know any information, um, which is exactly the, uh, the problem I've written on the slide here. And in fact, the sort of classical approach to that graph-based semi-supervised learning problem uh, is to uh, solve the uh, minimization problem that I have on the slide here. So in any event, um, if I want to solve a problem like this, uh, what we'll see is that the Laplacian actually kind of falls out. Um, so in particular, uh, a very common object in the geometry processing world is this thing called Dirichlet energy, which is what I show you at the top of the slide here in green. Uh, and this is a functional, uh, in this case nonlinear, that takes a function u and outputs a scalar value e of u. And the basic idea here is that I'm going to take u and compute its gradient, take the norm of that gradient squared, and then integrate that over the domain omega. So let's think about what that directly energy is measuring. So um, in particular, when is the gradient of a function zero? Well, the gradient of a function is zero exactly when the function is constant, right? So, uh, you know, we can think of E equals zero as kind of like uh, U being a constant function. 
And now when e is a, some big number, right, it's much bigger than zero. Well, if I think about plotting u, it has a lot of gradients. So in other words, it's changing very quickly, right? So maybe my function u looks something like that. And so the optimization problem uh, that I've given you on the bottom right in blue here, it's essentially saying, if I have information on the boundary of my domain, I know the values of u there, then what I'm going to do is find an interpolation that minimizes this energy value. In other words, uh, makes the rate of change of my function u as small as possible in between the locations uh, that I know. Now, if we had two lectures instead of one today, I would actually prove this formula. Uh, if you want, you can check out some of the videos of my class at MIT uh, for more careful proof. Um, but one thing that you can check is that if I start with this optimization problem and I minimize with respect to u, subject to these prescribed boundary conditions, uh, then one thing that I can show is that in the interior of my domain where u isn't prescribed, in other words, where I'm trying to kind of infer the values of u, uh, the Laplacian of that function is actually equal to zero. And there are a lot of different ways to uh, see why that might be the case. Um, we'll see that the uh, Laplacian operator also appears in the heat equation. So one way to understand uh, what's going on here is that I sort of place an initial distribution of heat on the boundary uh, of my domain omega and just let it diffuse outward. And this is somehow the steady state. Now, just like the one-dimensional case, I can compute eigenfunctions of the Laplacian operator. So here is an example. Um, and these are a set of functions that satisfy Laplace of phi equals lambda times phi. Uh, and as long as my domain is compact and its boundary is sufficiently well-behaved, um, it's sort of easy to check, at least using some standard tools from analysis, uh, that there is a discrete uh, sequence of eigenvalues for the Laplacian operator. Uh, and that they're all uh, positive. Um, one thing that you can now do is take these two interpretations of the Laplace operator uh, that I just mentioned, right? One is that it helps us measure the Dirichlet energy, and the other is uh, that it's involved in the wave equation. We can kind of put those two together um, to come up with like a nice uh, sort of understanding of these different vibration modes. So remember that. Uh, you know, when I compute the eigenvalues of an operator, I'm going to get a sequence of lambdas, right? Lambda 1, lambda 2, and so on. And by convention, we typically sort them, right? So that lambda 1 maybe is the first eigenvalue, lambda 2 is the second eigenvalue, and so on. Incidentally, the, uh, the first eigenvalue of Laplacian, uh, assuming a zero directly boundary condition, uh, is just zero, right? Because the, uh, the well, I guess assuming zero directly boundary condition, maybe you just ignore that. And then if you have Neumann or natural boundary condition, meaning that I have no, I, I don't care what happens on the boundary of the domain, um, then the first eigenvalue would be zero because the constant function um, satisfies uh, this relationship here. Okay, so um, in any event, uh, what this slide is trying to communicate uh, is that we can think of these lambdas as measuring uh, the Dirichlet energy uh, of the uh, eigenfunctions, right? Um, in particular, uh, one thing you can do is say, okay, so if I compute the Dirichlet energy of phi i, by definition, that's uh, equal to the uh, integral of the gradient of phi i squared, it's supposed to be a two, dA. Now, if I integrate by parts, um, what we'll find is that this is equal to one half the integral of phi i Laplacian of phi i. This is um, integrating by parts or Green Stokes theorem, whatever you want to call it. And now I can substitute in this eigenvalue relationship. And what I get is uh, lambda i over two, um, the integral of phi i squared. But this value is just one um, because it's an eigenfunction. Uh, right, so, so essentially what this relationship is telling us uh, is that the eigenfunctions are sort of sorted um, in terms of increasing Dirichlet energy. And if you take a look, uh, for example, at the figure here, that seems to make sense, right? The very first eigenfunction is somehow the one that's wiggling the least. And as I move to the right, as I move to higher frequencies, they're vibrating even faster and faster and faster, um, and they have more uh, gradient associated to them. All this is just to build some intuition. Now, unfortunately, uh, now we can ask exactly the same question. Namely, given the sequence of values lambda i, can you hear the shape of a drum? Uh, 
In other words, can you reconstruct a shape given that sequence of values lambda i? Now, a recent uh, paper from uh, Michael Bronstein and colleagues suggests that empirically you often can, um, but uh, unfortunately, um, in theory, you cannot. So here is an example of two shapes that we're going to call isospectral, meaning that if I go through that calculation and I only remember the lambda i's, I don't remember the phi i's or the shape of the boundary or anything else, um, I cannot distinguish between these two shapes. But these are rare. In other words, if you sort of look at the average pair of shapes out there in the universe, um, although I'm being extremely informal about that, um, you'll see that their spectra are quite different. Now, our last step here is to define Laplace operator on a curved domain. Uh, so for example, here we have the uh, curved bunny uh, surface. So um, a function on a surface is an assignment of a real value to every point. We often uh, illustrate those as uh, colored uh, uh, values on the surface. And now we have to go to a little bit more work to define the Laplace operator. Um, and in almost every single geometry processing set of course notes or textbook or what have you, um, this is where a lot of mathematical slice of hand have to happen because uh, there's a lot of analysis that you need to do this really, really rigorously. Um, and unfortunately, our discussion today, there'll be no exception to that uh, rule. But I'll, I'll do my best to give you a little bit of intuition for one way that you can get a Laplace operator on a curved surface, at least when it's embedded uh, in 3D. So one starting point um, is to define the gradient of a function. Um, already, this is a little bit tricky. Uh, incidentally, the proposition number here uh, is from my own course notes. I'll, I'll, I'll try to add a link uh, to those in case people are curious. Um, one of the things that you learn very early on in differential geometry class is given a function that goes from my surface into the real numbers, um, you define uh, an object called the differential. So the differential at a point P on my surface uh, takes the uh, tangent plane, oops, uh, not M, uh, the tangent plane of my surface S at P, and uh, maps that to a, a real value. And it's just the first uh, order sort of linear approximation of, of f uh, at the point p. So it turns out that that's an object that you can define topologically. It doesn't, you don't even need geometry to do it. Um, so one small leap from there is to define a gradient vector, um, where essentially uh, one thing that you can check is that df of a function p is equal to the dot product between the gradient of f at p, um, I guess if I evaluate this at v, um, with v, right? So oftentimes um, you do all these different gymnastics in your differential geometry course to define df as this linear operator, um, which is kind of funny because from, from calculus class, you probably thought about um, differentiating functions by getting a, a, a gradient field. Um, but it turns out that this is sort of important for divorcing uh, topology and geometry. But you actually can recover the geometric object, namely the gradient vector, um, in, in sort of an inverse way uh, and involving the metric of the surface. In any event, uh, the basic intuition here is that given a function, uh, it's not so hard to define uh, the gradient direction for that function. And then given a gradient direction, um, we can define uh, an analog of that Dirichlet energy that I uh, defined in the previous slide. Now for functions on my curved domain. So here uh, I have a lot of different functions on the bunny, sort of organized from, from high uh, Dirichlet energy to low Dirichlet energy. Uh, you can see that because somehow they look more smooth on the right-hand side. And notice that now um, this is actually fairly well defined. So if you're willing to believe that you can compute the gradient of a function on a surface, um, then all you have to do is take its norm squared and, and integrate it to get the Dirichlet energy. So here's where my sleight of hand is going to happen. So let's say that I want to go from Dirichlet energy to an operator. Notice that when we were talking about like drums that were in the plane, we did the opposite, right? We started with the operator and noticed that it was linked to Dirichlet energy. Um, we can do so as follows. So uh, Here's going to be the intuition. So let's say that I think in finite dimensions for a second. So let's say that I have um, some matrix A. And I compute the norm of A times x squared. Now, you might recall from your linear algebra class that you can write that as follows. It's x transpose A transpose A x. 
And now all I'm going to do is write parentheses around the last three terms of that expression. And so in other words, I can think of that as the dot product between x and a transpose a x. Now let's expand the left-hand side a little bit. The norm squared is the dot product between ax and ax. So the basic intuition here is that for every object that kind of looks like this uh, dot product on the left-hand side, there exists an operator here, right? This a transpose a, which only acts on one of the two inputs to the uh, inner product, but gives me the same value. Now, Here's where we're going to make our, our leap of faith, given our, our short lecture here. So let's say that I define the following um, h1 style inner product of two functions f and g on a surface. We can do, them, do that as follows. I'm going to take the gradient of f, dot product with the gradient of g pointwise, and then integrate that value. Notice if I put an f in twice, I get uh, basically the uh, Dirichlet energy. Then by a similar linear algebra argument to the one that I wrote down before, uh, one thing that you can check is that there exists an operator where this inner product that I define here is equal to the inner product of f and that operator applied to g. And that operator is exactly the Laplacian of the surface, or sometimes we call that the Laplace Beltrami operator of the uh, surface. I think the Beltrami name gets attached when it's on a curved domain. Um, there are all kinds of different ways to derive this. I'm going to show you the, actually, in the uh, discrete case, it's a little bit easier. Um, one nice sanity check is that if you're on an actual curved surface, um, then you can see that uh, the Laplace Beltrami operator actually coincides with uh, the Laplacian of the plane. So if I parameterize my surface in a way that preserves the metric right at the center point, then the uh, Laplacian of the pulled back function on the plane uh, agrees with the Laplacian on the curved domain. Okay. So there's your whirlwind introduction to the Laplacian operator. Um, we're already behind uh, time-wise, but uh, I think it's important to get a little bit of an intuition for how this object is de uh, defined in theory. Uh, and now we're going to move to the computational universe. So unfortunately, it's not so obvious if you read a uh, theoretical math textbook how you might go about discretizing the Laplacian operator, right? The one thing that you're likely to do is encounter these crazy Riemannian geometry formulas, like what I show you on this slide, um, which aren't particularly helpful uh, when it comes to differentiating a function on a triangle mesh. And the basic issue here is that typically in geometry processing, we have a function which is like one value per vertex of a mesh, for example, but the Laplacian is a second derivative operator. So the question I have to ask is how do I compute uh, all the second derivatives that I need to approximate this object? And the basic intuition um, that we're going to use here is we're going to apply a rule from calculus class again, which is integration by parts. Uh, and, and I've written it on the top here, right? The, and, and this is easy to check for the Laplacian operator on the plane. Remember, that's just like the sum of second derivatives. Um, that uh, if I integrate a function f against the Laplacian of g, that equals up to some terms on the boundary, which we're going to kind of ignore today. Um, the integral of the dot product between the gradient of f and the gradient of g. Right? You might remember this rule. Uh, again, it could be Stokes' theorem, Green's theorem, whatever. Uh, I'm going to call it uh, integration by parts uh, today. Now, why is this useful? What we're going to see is that, I mean, remember that like the Laplacian is like d squared dx squared plus d squared dy squared, um, I guess with the minus in front of it. Um, that's the second derivative object. There's only first derivatives involved in computing the gradient of something. And we're going to find that it's much easier to compute first derivatives on surfaces uh, than it is to compute second derivatives. And when you see that that's actually OK. Uh, so here's going to be the trick. Let's say that I want to solve something like the Poisson equation, which would be Laplacian of f equals g. right? So here, the input is, f, uh, is, is g, rather, and the output is f. What I'm going to do is say that, well, if this relationship is true, then I can take any function phi, and I know that the Laplacian, or the, the, the integral of phi against the Laplacian of f is equal to the integral of g times phi. Right? This is just multiply both sides by phi and integrate. So we're going to call a function f that satisfies this relationship for any set of phi in a particular class that we'll call test functions. 
We'll call these weak solutions of the uh, Poisson equation. And the kind of nice thing is that this is actually a first order uh, relationship in the sense that I can take that left hand side and write that as the integral of grad phi dot product grad f. There isn't a, a boundary, for example. So somehow the weak version of the Poisson equation is uh, first order and the strong version is second order. So here's the sort of outline that people typically use to derive um, a discrete Laplacian operator. Uh, this is called the Galerkin finite element method. Uh, and we do something like uh, what, I, what I've shown on this slide. So, so let's say that I want to solve uh, this differential equation. Again, the input is G and the output is F. This is uh, the Poisson um, equation, sort of a basic one. Uh, the eigenvalue problem is going to look quite similar. Then uh, one thing I can do is say, well, if that relationship is true, I'm going to take both sides, multiply them by a test function phi. There's psi, I guess. Um, sorry for changing my notation on you. Right, and this is true and for all psi, roughly. I mean, you know, when you say for all functions, it's always kind of a dangerous uh, phrase, uh, but we'll be informal today. And then the one additional observation is that if I integrate both sides against psi, well, now uh, I can integrate by parts on the right-hand side and get this first order relationship. So in the Galerkin FEM uh, method, what we're gonna do is write our function f in some basis, write a function g in the same basis, and we're gonna use that basis as our set of test functions. Right, so in other words, uh, I'm gonna plug in this expression for f, this expression for g in the relationship that I've starred here, and I'm going to test it against every single uh, test function psi i independently. And that is going to give me a finite dimensional uh, linear system of equations. And if you take a look, essentially what you're going to need to solve that uh, is, uh, well, it, it'll be sort of two different sets of constants, right? The inner products of the size against each other and the, integral, uh, the inner products of their uh, gradients against one another. So the matrix of inner products is going to be known as the mass matrix, and the matrix of inner products of gradients is going to be known as the stiffness uh, matrix. Okay, so let's uh, kind of eyeball uh, what happens here. So as a, an aside, of course, one thing that's really important to note is this is not the only way to approximate a Laplace operator on a uh, discrete surface. There are many different techniques. Uh, this is just one so that you can get your hands dirty. Um, so here's a nice uh, illustration of a very typical way people discretize. Uh, thank you to uh, Keenan for drawing this one. Um, so let's say that I have a function on a triangulated surface. The typical choice of basis for this function is going to kind of have a one on one vertex and a zero on all the vertices, all the other vertices for a single uh, uh, function in my basis, right? So there's gonna be a different basis function for each vertex here. And we're gonna call it the hat function. The reason it's the hat um, is kind of illustrated here that I'm gonna think of uh, the ith hat function as having value one um, on vertex vi, having value zero on all its neighbors, and being linearly interpolated across each of the triangle faces. Okay, so one way to understand that is that I'm going to think of a function on a triangulated surface as this linear combination uh, that I've written on this slide here. Um, or a different way to think about it is that this vector a of values essentially contains just the value of my function f of x at each vertex i. Okay, um, so at the end of the day, this composited uh, function f here um, really is like, I specify the value of f at each vertex i, uh, and then I just linearly interpolate that uh, function across all the faces. So now uh, let's think a little bit about uh, what we're gonna, what's gonna happen when we implement uh, Galerkin FEM um, using this hat basis. So remember that my functions uh, hi here are each linear across uh, one of the faces. So let's uh, dive into it a little bit. So remember that the basic uh, quantity that we're gonna need to compute are the inner products of gradients, right? That's what showed up in that Poisson equation I wrote down before. So let's say that I write f and g here in the uh, hat basis. 
right? So uh, I can think of our functions f and g as linear combinations of hat functions as shown in the previous slide. Um, the typical phrase that we use in geometry processing is that f and g are piecewise linear functions, meaning that they're sort of affinely interpolated across each face. Well, now um, the next thing we're going to do is compute the gradient of f and g. Well, if f and g are linear along every triangle, then one thing that you can convince yourself is that the gradient is one constant per triangular uh, face here, which is kind of nice, right? Notice that second derivatives would be difficult to compute in first order FEM, right? It makes sense to compute this derivative, but a piecewise constant function on a triangle mesh, um, if I differentiate it again, something kind of crazy would happen because it takes these big jumps along uh, every edge. In any event, now I can compute that dot product and I'll get one scalar value per face. And then I integrate it over the surface uh, to sum uh, over all the different triangles. So if I uh, go about doing this calculation and you do a lot of trigonometry involving those hat functions, um, what you're going to arrive at is a really famous formula. This is called the cotangent Laplacian operator. I almost guarantee you that in some talk in the uh, uh, SGP conference later this week, you'll encounter this formula at least once. So again, remember that this is like the inner product of the ith uh, hat function and the jth hat function. So I think the third relationship here makes the most sense, which is that uh, if these two vertices are not neighbors, that's what this tilde uh, thing here uh, means. It means neighbors. Then um, the, this inner product is equal to zero. Uh, and then you can verify uh, that essentially there's this sort of celebrated cotangent formula for computing all the remaining entries of this matrix. It's a little bit surprising um, that for one thing, it only depends on angles, right? So to get the Laplacian corresponding to an edge ij, you need the angles opposite um, that edge. Um, and so for example, notice that this matrix isn't affected by scaling my mesh uh, up and down. And it's also kind of surprising that it takes such a nice form. Um, so this is the basic uh, object that's explored and analyzed across millions and millions of geometry processing papers. So now uh, let's return to the Poisson equation. Remember that we're given G now as one value per vertex on a triangle mesh. So I guess the uh, image on the left-hand side is the one to pay attention to. Uh, and our goal is to compute F such that the Laplacian of F is equal to G. Okay, um, so let's say that we wanna solve that uh, using the finite element method. So remember that we're gonna think of F as um, the sum of a bunch of coefficients in front of the hat functions. Maybe G is a bunch of uh, coefficients in front of uh, hat fun the same hat functions. And now to get a linear system of equations, we're going to take both sides of this formula and integrate it against yet another hat function like that, uh, where the indices go from one to the, uh, the total number of, of vertices, right? So that'll give us a square uh, linear system. Uh, so when we do that, Right. What we're going to get, uh, well, on the left-hand side here, uh, remember that we now need a vector of values, which is the integral of Laplacian f against each of the hat functions i. Well, that's exactly, oops, the uh, cotangent Laplacian applied to that vector a, um, sort of by definition. Now, what I haven't done is actually given you the right-hand side, right? So in addition um, to what I already showed you, I also need the inner product of the hat functions against each other, right? That's, that's how to do this, this right-hand side here. But that nice sort of elegant argument that I il illustrated for you a few slides ago no longer works, right? So remember that we took a piecewise linear function, we differentiated it to get something piecewise constant, um, and that turns out to be a nice way to get the cotangent Laplacian operator. Well, if I take two piecewise linear functions and I don't differentiate them first, but I multiply them together, then, well, so if I have two linear operators, or two linear functions rather, and I multiply them, I'm gonna get something quadratic. And quadratic things are often kind of hard to integrate. <laughs> uh, so unfortunately, it turns out that a nice uh, linear algebra argument um, doesn't 
quite work here. Like you actually have to do uh, an integral instead of just computing the right gradient, um, gradient vectors and, and dot products together. So there's two basic approaches that people use here. Um, and this is all to compute an object that we call the mass matrix, which is the inner product of the hat functions not gradiented against one another. Um, one is to actually just compute the darn thing. Um, so here, uh, this is the formula that I've given you on the slide is the true inner product of hat functions. Notice that this matrix is not diagonal, and, and that makes sense, right? So in one dimension, right, our hat functions might look like a triangle, and then another triangle like that. And so when I multiply them against each other, they do overlap. It's a common misconception um, that the true mass matrix uh, for a finite element pro uh, problem really is uh, not diagonal. It rather has the same sparsity as the Laplace matrix. Um, now, in geometry processing, we're often kind of lazy. Um, and empirically, one thing people have noticed uh, is that it's often OK to take that mass matrix and approximate it with something diagonal. Um, so a very common approximation is to look at maybe the Voronoi cell or the, um, uh, what is this? Well, any dual mesh of, of cells around the vertices, and we're going to sum up the areas and just uh, sum them to the, uh, the center point here uh, and write that as a diagonal matrix. Um, the basic intuition here uh, is that really the, um, the mass matrix in a finite element problem is used to integrate functions uh, against each other. And so one sort of simple thing to do is to think of them as sort of constant in these little blue cells. Uh, rather than linearly interpolating along faces. But notice that that's actually a bit of a lie um, because it's not obeying the uh, piecewise linear uh, relationship. In any event, uh, at this point, you have all the ingredients you need uh, to take your Poisson equation, um, discretize it, and solve uh, something as a uh, matrix problem. Uh, so here, uh, I've taken my function g on my Homer Simpson uh, 3D model and solved for f. Uh, and, and one thing to notice, I got something smoother that's not a mistake. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that's the machinery that we need to solve Poisson equation. I can similarly uh, solve the eigenvalue problem, right? So in order to solve the eigenvalue problem, I'll, I'll end up doing something similar, right? Like if I have Laplacian of phi equals lambda times phi, well, now I can write phi in the hat basis, right? So, um, you know, I'm going to write phi is equal to the sum of ai times the hat function i, and I'm going to integrate this thing against all of the possible hat functions j. And what I'll get is the integral of hj against the sum over ai on the portion of hi uh, is equal to, uh, well, the integral of hj again against the sum uh, of lambda times ai hi. And uh, here, what are my unknowns? My unknowns are the a's and lambda. It's not h, right? And so one thing you can do is say, well, once again, uh, you know, I can further simplify the uh, left-hand side, right? That this is the, uh, maybe I, I, I factor out the a's. So this is the sum of ai times the integral of grad hj dot product grad hi. This is a constant. Right? It's exactly, again, the elements of the cotangent matrix. This um, integral of hj against hi, those are the elements of the mass matrix. So at the end of the day, I'm going to get that the Laplacian times a is equal to the lambda times the mass matrix times a, which is how I can solve uh, that uh, eigenvalue problem. Um, so in other words, uh, my eigenfunction problem in 3D uh, ends up being what we'll call a generalized eigenvalue problem because there's a matrix on the right-hand side. Or if you prefer, it's an eigenvalue problem of the uh, matrix M inverse times L. Okay. Um, notice, by the way, that uh, in this problem where I don't have a boundary, I've omitted the first eigenvalue. You might ask as a sanity check why. And that's just because it's zero, right? It's the, the constant function which isn't super exciting to uh, illustrate here. 
So that gives you some rough sketch of how uh, Laplace operators are derived uh, in practice. Of course, this is only the beginning of the story. Um, first order finite elements is relatively inaccurate. There are all kinds of different ways that uh, people extend. Um, one kind of fun website you can look at is the uh, periodic table of finite elements, which shows you how to do higher order stuff. Um, there's also a very famous uh, literature for computing Laplacian operators on uh, point clouds. So the simplest one of this uh, example of, of this type uh, goes to Belkin and Yogi in 2003, um, which is essentially just evaluating um, a Gaussian uh, in distance between every pair of points in your point cloud. Um, notice this is a dense matrix, incidentally, which is one of the big problems in uh, point cloud uh, style Laplace operators. Okay, so now we're going to sketch out a few uh, applications of spectral methods. Uh, and, and we're just going to do this very quickly so you can see how the Laplacian appears all over the place in our uh, everyday life. So there are a lot of different reasons to study the Laplace operator. We've already seen several. Um, and let's see a, a few more, right? So for one, we'll see that it encodes intrinsic uh, geometry, like the edge lengths of a triangle mesh or the uh, experience an ant might have crawling along a surface. Uh, it's multi-scale in nature, right? The, uh, the low frequencies sort of tell you something about the entire uh, surface all at once. And as you move into the higher frequency information, they're sort of telling you about the uh, smaller details of your domain. Uh, one really nice thing is that you're doing geometry, but it's through linear algebra style computation, right? So um, linear algebra is a universe that is very well supported in the numerical computing uh, world. Uh, and so somehow the Laplacian gives you a way to study geometry through the lens of this very well-established numerical machinery. Uh, and then finally, the Laplacian is well-connected to many different physics problems. We already saw the wave equation. Um, we'll see a few more. And that helps us ground a lot of these algorithms that I'll talk about uh, in some physical intuition. So to expand upon that first point a little bit, um, remember that our Laplace operator uh, and the uh, accompanying mass matrix can be written uh, as I have on the slide. One thing, if you're in the discrete differential geometry universe that you might notice is that, well, the Laplace operator only involves angles and areas on the uh, 3D surface. When I say areas, I mean like areas of triangles, not like the volume that it encloses or something like that. So as a corollary, any computation that I do that only involves these two matrices here uh, is what we call intrinsic, meaning that if I take my domain and I bend it without stretching, these computations actually won't see it, right? So for example, if I have two triangles that hinge about a shared edge like that, um, well, none of the edge lengths change as that hinge happens. Uh, and so these matrices L and A actually are unaffected by that deformation. This can be either a feature or a bug, depending on how you think about it, right? On the one hand, um, for certain types of deformation, you may actually want to quotient that out in your geometric computation, which is, in which case, this is a feature. Um, in other cases, uh, what that means is you're sort of throwing away interesting geometric information about your domain. Uh, in any event, that hinging motion, right, these two triangles that share an edge and can hinge along each other, um, is known as isometry, which is like bending without stretching, right? Paper bends uh, isometrically. Uh, and so there's this term that shows up all over the geometry processing literature, which is that algorithms often are intrinsic, meaning that if I apply an isometric deformation to a surface, the algorithm is actually unaffected. And the hope here, the reason why people were so excited about using the Laplacian to define isometry invariant algorithms is that um, often they're inspired by articulated characters like humans moving around. Now humans are filled with bones, and what that means is that we roughly de uh, deform isometrically, right? It's not like your skin is stretching a lot, a lot as you move your arms and legs. Unfortunately, if you read the mathematical theory, you'll see that the true isometry invariant condition um, is actually quite rigid, meaning that actually the only surfaces that are known to deform isometrically are developable. Um, which are flat things like uh, uh, paper. Um, so although it's often uh, the case that people will sell their algorithm as isometry invariant, and that's really exciting because some other invariant to pose of a 3D character, um, one thing that's important to understand is exactly the behavior of the algorithm for approximate isometry as well, because the reality is as humans, we deform approximately isometrically, not completely isometrically. So 
As a first example of a task you can solve using a Laplace operator, uh, let's talk about shape descriptors. So the basic idea of a shape descriptor is that I'm going to take every point on a surface, uh, sigma in this case, and I'm going to assign it a vector of numbers. Uh, and that vector of numbers is supposed to uh, describe the role of the point on the surface relative to the rest of the geometry. So for example, maybe uh, on this bunny character, the descriptor of the two ears is probably going to be pretty similar, um, whereas a descriptor of the side, a point on the side here, uh, maybe is quite different. Right? And, and once I have a shape descriptor, uh, there are many useful things that I can do with that, right? I could retrieve similar parts from other shapes, like maybe I want to take this ear off of the bunny and replace it with uh, some other ear from a different 3D model. Uh, or maybe I want to take this bunny and map it to another bunny where the ear is a little bit deformed or, or, or something like that. Um, so these are kind of nice because you map them into this canonical space uh, and then you know saying well what points are similar to this point on the ear? Well the ear gets mapped somewhere. The other point on the ear probably gets mapped nearby um, so they're easy to cluster together. Whereas in 3D space uh, these points are, are quite far apart. Right? And that's because uh, uh, proximity in 3D is really a bad proxy for similarity uh, geometrically. Right? So the task of, of a descriptor is to kind of characterize the local geometry nearby and somehow describe the, the role of a point on a surface. Um, for example, points that cluster together in pairs might indicate that the surface has a uh, symmetry. Um, so a very common task is to compute an intrinsic descriptor, meaning that it is invariant to that isometric deformation we talked about. Uh, the very famous uh, intrinsic descriptor out there, which is Gaussian curvature. Um, there's a theorem from Gauss, unsurprisingly, uh, that actually proves this, which isn't 100% obvious from the uh, formula. The problem is Gaussian curvature is just one number, right? But you have a two-dimensional surface, uh, so the surface totally isn't um, defined by that single quantity. Moreover, Gaussian curvature uh, is a second derivative, um, meaning that can be noisy uh, to compute. So this really isn't the end of the story. So here's a very simple uh, intrinsic descriptor that's based on the calculations we've already introduced. Um, this is called the Global Point Signature, GPS. Uh, it was introduced at this conference in 2007 uh, by Raif Rustamov. Uh, and the basic uh, idea here is very simple, which is you take the Laplace operator, you compute its sequence of eigenfunctions, right? That's phi one, phi two, phi three, and so on. Uh, you scale them, uh, in this case, by one over the root of the eigenvalue. There's uh, some technical details why you might want to do that. And now, it, one way I can think about this is that it's like a long matrix, right? So um, if I compute these things, in one direction of my matrix is each vertex in my mesh. Um, the other one is uh, which uh, eigenvalue I'm in. Right? So I think we're used to thinking about it vertically, right? We compute one eigenfunction at a time. But now if we slice our matrix horizontally, right, then each point P here gets associated to a vector of values of the scaled uh, Laplacian eigenfunction. And this uh, vector of values is the GPS uh, signature of a point. And the GPS signature uh, is, is not just nice because it's smooth, it comes with some nice uh, theoretical properties. So for example, um, if our surface doesn't self-intersect, then neither does the uh, GPS embedding, meaning that no two uh, points get the same uh, descriptor, unlike the uh, Gaussian curvature we talked about before. So what does that mean? Well, that means that it's somehow taking the geometry of your surface and embedding it into this other space that quotients out things like uh, rigid motion and isometric deformation. Now, there's some problems uh, with the GPS that led people to propose all kinds of different variations. Um, in particular, when they're repeated eigenvalues, um, there's some theoretical issues with the way things are proven. And in addition to that, it's a, a non-local feature, right? Every single eigenfunction of the uh, surface extends along the entire domain. So shortly thereafter, uh, some variations on the theme were uh, proposed, which uh, somehow have uh, some nicer properties for geometry processing. And these are really the descriptors that we tend to use today. Um, so, in order to derive these, folks went back to the uh, inspiration that we have from the physical universe. And uh, in particular, rather than thinking about the wave equation, um, initially we thought about the heat equation. 
Now, the heat equation is extremely close to the wave equation, with one exception, which is that there's a first derivative on the left-hand side instead of the second. And essentially, this PDE is determining the propagation of heat along the domain as a function of time. Uh, so you're given some initial distribution of heat, and then this tells you how it diffuses outward. So one thing that you should double check at home, uh, it's a good piece of homework if you haven't done it before, is that if you know the Laplace eigenfunctions of a surface, you can actually just solve the heat equation in closed form. Um, so uh, in particular, uh, if I know that u at t equals zero is given by the sum um, a n phi n of x, right? So I take the initial conditions of u and I write them out in the phi basis, then uh, this uh, formula here uh, gives you the uh, heat equation solution for all time t bigger than zero. Okay, and notice that essentially all that happens is that uh, we decay the uh, nth uh, eigenvalue or, or, or the coefficient in front of the nth eigenfunction as a function of time, where the rate of decay has to do with the eigenvalue. Intuitively, that makes sense, right? Because what it's saying is that very high frequency components of a function decay more quickly uh, when heat diffuses out, um, whereas the low frequency stuff can, can last longer. So based on this uh, connection between the heat equation and the Laplace operator, um, in 2009, a couple of years after the uh, GPS was proposed, um, came the heat kernel signature of a point. Um, and this uh, is built on that heat diffusion intuition. So the heat kernel signature um, is associated to a point x on my surface, and it is a function of time t. Notice that GPS was like a discrete set of values. The HKS is a function of time t. And essentially, what it is, is it tells you if I put a little pinprick of heat at point x at time zero, and then I just let it diffuse outward, how much heat will be left? Right? And you can read off the solution to that problem, um, basically using the, that closed form that I have on the previous slide. Um, and this has a lot to do with geometry. So in particular, um, one thing to know, so like, let's say that I'm on an extremely uh, curved domain, right? So like a, a sphere with a very tight radius. Well, um, in that case, uh, for example, it could be the case that the heat diffuses around the sphere and comes back to the point, um, and maybe it diffuses away very quickly because there's not very many neighbors. On the other hand, if I have an extremely hyperbolic uh, surface, maybe heat diffuses more slowly and it ever comes back. Um, and so there are all kinds of different links uh, between heat diffusion and the curvature of your domain. In fact, uh, one way you can understand the HKS is this sort of a multi-scale uh, notion of curvature. So in the HKS paper, essentially they discretize this quantity here and they associate this function of t to each point x as a descriptor. So for example, in the plot here, um, you can see that points one and two are on the front toes and three and four are on the back toes. And they've plotted the uh, HKS as a function of actually the log of t. And you can see that the, uh, the front toes uh, cluster together and the back toes uh, cluster together uh, as functions, which makes sense because this uh, dragon character, even though it's bent, right, so it doesn't actually have a left-right symmetry in the sense that like, I can't cut it with a plane uh, and flip things left to right, um, you're still able to cluster those two sides together. Uh, and the HKS has a lot of nice properties. So it's isometry invariant, it's multi-scale, um, it's not subject to switching like when, the, uh, when there's a repeated eigenvalue, uh, and it's still relatively easy to compute. Um, empirically, uh, some folks uh, in some follow-up work uh, to the heat uh, kernel signature proposed the wave kernel signature, which is sort of the analog uh, for the wave equation. And the one thing to know about this, uh, which I believe is actually more used in practice these days, um, is that the WKS uh, tends to be more sensitive to small features rather than large ones. And there are many others. So essentially, there's just a ton of spectral geometry uh, style descriptors out there in terms of Laplace and eigenstructure. Um, in fact, there's kind of a fun paper that says, well, I can actually understand the HKS, WKS, and many other alternatives um, as just different weighted combinations of the squares of the eigenfunction of Laplace. So maybe I'll apply machine learning to learn a good uh, descriptor, right? learn that function f, uh, given, for example, uh, 
you, you know, pairs of surfaces or pairs of points that you think should have similar or different uh, descriptors. Um, so this is an idea in 2014, um, which arguably led in some sense to uh, some of the geometric deep learning uh, algorithms we see today. So at the end of the day, the one thing to get out of the computations I've shown you so far is that basically given the list of eigenfunctions and eigenvalues of the Laplace operator, um, I can just apply a formula to those values, like do no other interesting computation and get all of these interesting different descriptors, right? The HKS, WKS, GPS, uh, and so on. Um, and that's only the tip of the iceberg. It turns out that Laplacians appear everywhere in chance analysis and geometry processing. So here I'll give you a big grab bag of uh, different places you can look. So for example, um, one task you might think about is feature extraction, like finding the kind of interesting points um, on a surface. So initially people talk about doing that with um, extrema of curvature. That turns out to be kind of unstable because curvature uh, is sensitive to little wiggles on your surface. Um, but extrema of the heat kernel turn out to be um, a good uh, choice here. So you can see that these uh, spheres are somehow consistently chosen among the different domains as interesting features. A different thing you could do uh, is try and use the Laplacian uh, for correspondence problems. So maybe I'm given two elephants, one with its trunk down and then you know, a second elephant with its trunk up. And my task is for each point on the first elephant, identify the corresponding point on the second elephant. Um, one way that you can do that, uh, it turns out you can map, well, you could map into the heat kernel signature and look for a closest point, um, but it turns out you can do better. Um, which is if you're willing to mark a few points, like uh, the user loads in these two elephant models and then tells you, well, I know that this point uh, on one surface corresponds to this, you know, point number six on this surface is point number six on that one. Um, that with just one pair of such points, um, there's a different computation you can do known as the heat kernel map instead of the heat kernel signature that is guaranteed to distinguish all the points from one another. So in other words, you map all the points on the surface to their sort of heat kernel descriptors. You do that for those two surfaces, then you do closest point matching, and what you get is a map from one surface to the other, um, which is guaranteed to be correct in the isometry uh, case. Right? So if my two surfaces are isometric deformations of one another, uh, this mapping algorithm uh, is perfect. Again, this is a nice example where the problem is that no surfaces are ever isometric to one another. So in practice, uh, a lot of additional work is needed to get a nice smooth map. Um, if I do the same thing from the surface to itself, uh, then I end up finding objects called intrinsic symmetries. So for example, um, the human on the right hand side is not symmetric in the sense that you learn in high school uh, uh, geometry class, right? If I draw the symmetry plane of this human up and down, you have to apologize, my line kind of veered to the side here. Um, there's not a left-right symmetry in the sense that one arm is down and one arm is facing up. But there's an intrinsic symmetry. Um, one way to, to understand intrinsic symmetry maybe is that the distance function, um, the geodesic distance function along the surface has a symmetry, for example. Um, or a different way to put it is that there's maybe a map phi, which takes points in my surface, maps point, and maps at two points on my surface, but phi is not equal to the identity. So in this case, it like swap left and right, but phi preserves um, distances between points um, intrinsically, meaning geodesic, like along the surface. Uh, one way to find such a self map uh, is to look for pairs of points whose heat kernels kind of look the same. Uh, and that leads to a nice symmetry detection uh, technique. A different thing you could do maybe is to compute distances between points. So um, one, so in general, uh, the distance between points on a surface uh, is known as geodesic distance, right? So maybe uh, the geodesic distance would be like the length of a path connecting those points constrained to move along the domain. That's sort of the distance, but there exists other distances, like a distance <laughs> between points that aren't distances like the length of a path, but still respect the triangle inequality and can be useful in practice. Um, so one of those uh, is the biharmonic distance, which sort of intuitively is like, I put a little prick of uh, heat at some point and I diffuse it out for some fixed period of time. 
Now I do the same thing to another point. Uh, and if I want to know the biharmonic distance between these, this isn't precisely the right definition, by the way, but intuitively it's, it's kind of similar. Um, you compute the L2 distance between those two uh, 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 functions along the entire surface. Right? So uh, there are all kinds of different um, sort of harmonic uh, style distances that compute functions on surfaces corresponding to two points um, and, and then compute their L2. Uh, so for example, in one dimension, let's say that I have P and Q here. Well, if I diffuse out um, heat from point P, I'll end up with a Gaussian function. It looks something like this, right? So we'll call this maybe uh, GP. If I diffuse out heat from Q, I'll get some other function GQ. Uh, and then I can define some distance between P and Q as the uh, integral of GP minus GQ squared. Um, dx, right? So um, this thing satisfies the uh, triangle inequality, but it is not the distance between p and q. This is not equal to the absolute value of p minus q in, in one dimension, um, but it is easily computable. Uh, and it actually has other kind of nice properties. It's sort of stable and sensitive to small changes. Um, if you want true geodesic distances between points, it turns out you can recover those from the heat kernel. Um, this is essentially a, a, a theorem called Veradan's theorem. So this uh, technique called geodesics and heat from 2013 um, is a geodesic computation algorithm built on spectral computation. You can smooth out surfaces by flowing them along the Laplacian applied to the coordinate function. This is called mean curvature flow. Uh, and it's sort of the standard practice for smoothing out surfaces. Um, you can also understand this as um, gradient descent on surface area. So in fact, if you compute the gradient of surface area in the vertices of your mesh, um, one thing that you'll see is that that ends up being actually just the Laplacian applied to the vertex position function. So there's a nice uh, connection there. Uh, and, and so that's one way to sort of understand what mean curvature flow is doing in addition to the sort of well-known explanation, which is that it's moving surfaces along the uh, mean curvature weighted normal. The Laplacian also shows up in parametrization problems, right? So maybe I have a 3D surface and I want to map it into the plane. Um, I can do that by solving Laplace equals zero, subject to Dirichlet boundary conditions that sort of pin the boundary of the uh, domain on the plane. This is uh, often uh, called the uh, tut embedding, T-U-T-T-E. Um, and it Although this is sort of a rudimentary uh, technique for parametrization, it's also the basis for a lot of the more complicated uh, techniques that we see uh, today. Um, and of course, these days in our modern universe, um, we see the Laplacian used as a regularizer for deep learning. So for instance, in this pixel to mesh paper, um, the task here is to go from a rendered image like this, uh, this car on the left um, and to realize it as a triangulated uh, surface, in this case, a deformation of a sphere. Um, so one uh, sort of typical regularizer you might add in a learning problem like this um, is the Dirichlet energy of a coordinate function, um, which has the effect of essentially smoothing the domain out. Right? So you can see here when they add the Laplacian regularizer, uh, they get a much smoother car uh, than what you might get otherwise. And then finally, I believe there's another talk at SGP that covers this in more detail. So I'm going to omit it, um, but the sort of standard uh, techniques um, that we often use for mesh correspondence, like mapping one mesh to another, um, using uh, functions are built on Laplace operator as well. So in this case, uh, if I have a map from surface A to surface B, well, now if I draw a paint on surface B, I can pull that paint back to surface A, right? So if I color the second surface, I can color the first one by following the map forward and then copying the color that I see back, right? So in other words, for every map from A to B, I have a map of functions on B to functions on A um, by the, uh, the pullback operator. And this basic observation uh, inspired this idea of a functional map, which has been uh, extremely impactful in the geometry processing world. Um, so essentially, uh, what that's going to do uh, is give you a linear algebraic way to uh, compute maps between surfaces. Uh, and this was extended in 2017 um, using deep networks which 
combine that sort of spectral computation with learned descriptors uh, on the surface. And the list goes on and on. Um, so for instance, shape uh, retrieval was one of the early uh, applications of Laplacian. The nodal domains, like the place where the sign of the uh, eigenfunctions is constant, um, often form a nice quad mesh on a surface. Um, uh, and it's also the basic uh, unit of, of certain surface deformation techniques. So as always, uh, I'm going way over, but we'll spend our last couple minutes talking about some extensions beyond the basic Laplace operator. So hopefully, I know this lecture has gone kind of quickly, but hopefully the basic message that you can get out um, is that there's this sort of magic matrix that you can compute, right? This one guy, um, like this cotangent Laplacian, which at the end of the day, is just some second derivative thing. And then by doing things like inverting it, computing its eigenfunctions, and so on, um, I can do all these kinds of geometry processing tests that are essentially just simple expressions in terms of the eigenvalues and eigenvectors uh, of this matrix. A more modern question people have started to ask is like, well, why the Laplacian? Like, why not substitute some other operator uh, and see what that does? So for instance, um, you know, the Laplacian is maybe sensitive to certain deformations and insensitive to, to others. If I uh, edit the Laplacian in some fashion, then essentially I'm editing the behavior of my uh, spectral geometry technique. Um, so the first generation of techniques uh, that did this were essentially just different variations of the Laplacian. So maybe I wanted to make my Laplacian computation invariant to scaling of the surface, uh, for example. Um, then maybe I, I go back in the coefficients of that matrix and I remove or divide by uh, some things that involve uh, edge lengths. Um, so for example, the scale invariant heat kernel signature was uh, one example of that. Uh, more recently, uh, I think the inspiration for many different extensions of this basic spectral techniques, um, I think was, was illustrated really nicely in this 2010 paper, which is that a ton of geometry processing algorithms are applied to discrete triangulated surfaces, right, triangle meshes. Um, but the reality is that the triangle meshes are what um, computer-aided design people would call boundary uh, representations, right, BREPs. Um, so for example, uh, if I have a 3D model of a hand, our geometry processing techniques really are treating that hand like a rubber glove. Um, and what that means is that isometry invariance and all the other properties that we like are really based on deformations of the rubber glove, not based on deformations of your volumetric uh, hand. And so a very typical uh, sort of question to ask is what would it take to make these spectral algorithms sensitive to volumetric information? And in fact, uh, that really comes to the, the front when you see examples like the one I've shown you here. Um, so here, uh, I have a 3D uh, cube with a bump in it. And essentially all I've done is taken that bump and flipped it in or out on the top of the cube. One thing that uh, you can convince yourself is that actually the geodesic distance between any pair of points on this domain uh, is not affected by this kind of large deformation here, right? Because all I did was kind of take scissors to this upper part of the face, cut it out, and then flip it over. Um, and so a different way of putting that is that these nice isometry invariant algorithms that I've mentioned actually are throwing away information from the start, right? Like I think we would all consider these two surfaces to be quite different, but from the perspective of the Laplacian operator, they're actually identical to one another. And there are many different ways uh, out. So for example, um, one common technique would be to essentially follow exactly the same path, but construct a Laplacian operator for the volumetric domain, like the entire hand, including its inside as a three-dimensional domain, rather than just the outer surface. And indeed, uh, that does lead to correct behavior, but it has a lot of drawbacks. So you need a tetrahedralization of your domain, right? You can't just have triangles. Um, you have a larger uh, matrix. And also, sort of philosophically in some sense, um, you can think of the tetrahedral mesh as really just taking up space in the inside, right? All the interesting geometry, even in a volumetric problem, is still on the outer surface. Um, so for example, if I have two different sets of tets that both have the same boundary surface, our discrete Laplacian will have slightly different eigenvalue, but it's not really clear that you know, the problem has changed all that much. Um, so there are a lot of attempts to get around this, right, in order to do uh, computations on the outer surface, which are sensitive to deformations of the volume, 
Um, so for example, uh, back in 2012, um, Klaus uh, Hildebrandt and colleagues uh, proposed um, using the sh thin shell uh, energy um, as a way to derive uh, operators that are sensitive to this extrinsic uh, style change. So here, um, essentially, they're using models from, from physics that are uh, sensitive to all the different types of deformation, including hinging, um, computing basically just the Hessian of that uh, and using that as the operator instead of the Laplacian. Um, some more uh, recent work uh, does things like takes the uh, inner surface, offsets it along its normal, and then uses the Laplace operator of the inner surface and this displaced one. Um, and this displacement operation, it turns out, is sensitive to extrinsic geometry. Um, so both of these two methods, in some sense, can be understood as like thin shell style uh, Laplacian operators that kind of treat the surface as like a thin but not zero width uh, slice cutting through space. Um, my student Yu uh, proposed a different thing, which is um, a little bit closer to volumetric uh, geometry. This is called the Dirichlet to Neumann or Steklov operator. The basic idea here um, is you start with a domain. So in two dimensions, it would be a curve and 3D would be a surface. And you prescribe a function on that domain, like f. You interpolate it to the interior of the domain by solving that um, Laplace or Poisson equation that we talked about in earlier slides. And then you kind of take the gradient of that interpolated function and restrict it back to the boundary. So when you compose all those steps together, you get an operator uh, called the directly to Neumann operator, which makes sense. It's converting directly boundary conditions to Neumann ones. Um, and it turns out that you can sort of bypass uh, this inner volumetric problem and write the full operator as a boundary integral, meaning that you don't actually need to measure the inside, um, but still uh, this operator is sensitive to uh, volumetric geometry. So that's a nice um, idea. Uh, unfortunately, there's no free lunch here. Um, in particular, it gets around needing a tight mesh of the domain, uh, but you no longer can use the finite element method. You have to use a more complicated technique. Uh, known as the boundary element method. Or finally, uh, you could just try and throw out the Laplacian altogether uh, and try different operators uh, that exist out there in uh, mathematics and physics. Uh, so for instance, there's some really interesting papers involving the Dirac operator, which is some kind of spiritual square root of the Laplace operator uh, that's sensitive to um, extrinsic geometry because it kind of looks like the derivative of the normal vector uh, to the surface. Uh, and this thing has been successfully uh, applied uh, to all kinds of interesting shape analysis uh, problems with, with very similar results, I think, in some sense, to um, these techniques uh, that are based on modal analysis and thin shells. And then finally, it's worth mentioning um, that some folks recently have proposed actually learning uh, different operators on the surface. So for example, if you think of the Laplacian as just sort of taking a weighted average of information near a point uh, on the surface and subtracting out the value at the center, um, then maybe what you do is you learn the averaging weights as a function of geometry and different bending and stretching directions. Uh, so for example, this paper in 2016 um, proposes an entire anisotropic convolutional neural network uh, that exists on a surface uh, and propagates information around, uh, again, by using Laplace type operators where the metric or the sort of geometric part uh, is learned in the process. Um, this is one of the very early um, geometric deep learning papers uh, and has inspired a lot of follow-up work um, where essentially you're using Laplacian style calculations on a surface as a stand-in for a convolution uh, operator that you might see in a neural network applied to an image. In any event, uh, in this lecture, uh, we've covered all kinds of interesting um, applications of the Laplace operator, giving you a bit of a taste of how you can compute it both in theory and practice, and some of the modern extensions which involve uh, computing alternatives to the Laplacian uh, operator by drawing inspiration from mathematical physics and other uh, directions. Um, of course, there are many uh, other problems that we can solve and continue to be examined in geometry processing world. Uh, I think the most popular ones right now involve essentially learning uh, the Laplacian operator, its inverses, eigenfunctions, and so on based on data rather than based on physical models. Uh, which holds the sort of promise of learning the interesting geometric features that are uh, 
relevant for an applied problem rather than trying to guess them by hand. Um, with this idea of hand design features slowly becoming antiquated, although a little bit more slowly uh, in geometry than in image processing. Um, in addition to that, uh, we're extending to higher dimensions uh, and trying to accelerate these computations so that they can happen right at the edge uh, in real time. So normally at this point, I would uh, stop and, and, and ask if folks have any questions. Of course, uh, we're not able to do that today, um, but I encourage you all to uh, attend the relevant sessions at SGP uh, or follow up uh, with me through email, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have that way. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Uh, and uh, it's really a pleasure to share some of the information about uh, spectral geometry uh, with the SGP audience.